Uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Dan Byman. I'm a professor here in the School of Foreign Service. And I am delighted today that we are going to hear Rochelle Davis. I, I think most of you know her, uh, certainly by reputation, if not in person. Uh, she is a professor of cultural anthropology in the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies uh, here at Georgetown School of Foreign Service. Uh, she is the author, uh, among many things, but I'll single out her book on uh, Palestinian village history, and that has been uh, lauded uh, in the scholarly community. And uh, she is uh, talking to us today, on, I'm not going to say a new project, but on a very different project that uh, she's been working on for a while that looks at, uh, repeat the title here, Culture, Cultural Training, and the War in Iraq and Afghanistan, which I think uh, draws on uh, her multiple passions. Uh, yet it is of interest, I would say, uh, to a lot of different communities here at Georgetown. So please join me in welcoming Rochelle to your talk. Okay. I'm, I'm using this lapel mic. Is it actually working? Can you hear me back there? It's not on. It's, <laughs> the green light is on. Am I supposed to do something else other than that? The magic box over there with Mora is doing something. I can keep talking if that's helpful. It's not working. Green light is on like you told me to. No? It should be. OK, I guess we're going to use this. OK. I'll unhook myself. Okay. Sorry, I have to use this. But can you hear me now? Is that? This is on now. Sorry. Sorry. You just have to bellow your own shells. OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't have much bellowing ability these days. Something has happened to my voice. I'm hoping it's not, I'm not turning into an adolescent boy, but I might be. Um, I'm a little late for that and of the wrong sex. But. So can you hear me now? Is that? OK, perfect. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to move in and out of sort of talking and my paper and the PowerPoint. And um, I have a few words on the PowerPoint, but I was an art history major, so mostly the PowerPoint is just going to be images. Um, so. Let me start with an introduction um, about what I'm interested in and what I'm doing. Um, and this is about the concept of culture, which took a new life in US military strategy with the wars of the 21st century, figuring into larger policies as well as entering in the calculations of day-to-day -day actions of troops. At the time of the US invasions of Afghanistan in 2001 and Iraq in 2003, cultural knowledge and cultural training were not part of the vocabulary of war. By the mid-stage of both wars in 2006, Culture was included in the new strategies that were being developed. Um, and it was set out to become a significant factor in designing and carrying out missions in war within counterinsurgency campaigns and in stabilization operations. My talk today will discuss US foreign policy and strategy in both these wars. But what I'm really interested in is looking, is at looking specifically at the shifts to a counterinsurgency doctrine, which you all know as COIN, that emphasizes the importance of culture. And I will trace the strategy that was developed somewhat, how troops were trained, what their experiences were in Iraq and Afghanistan, and how this new focus on culture fit into ideas about how to fight wars. And I'm kind of going to focus on, this is my outline, um, sort of three questions. Why the turn to culture? What did culture, what did the culture turn consist of? And then what did the culture turn mean for Iraqis, Afghans, and US troops? And that last question I'm going to weave throughout, sort of trying to answer the first two questions. I want to tell you a little bit about myself, mostly because I'm an anthropologist, and that's what we do. We're very reflexive about our own positions in these fields. So forgive me for a few minutes um, to tell you that. Um, I am an anthropologist of the Arab world. I'm fluent in Arabic, and I've done all of my research in the Arab world. Um, so for me to turn to this topic was one, both because I was horrified by the concept of um, the US invading and occupying countries um, and what that was going to mean for all of us, not least of all the Afghans and the Iraqis, but also because um, I, I thought of, as someone who knows something about the culture of the Arab world that I could come to this with a different kind of perspective and try and understand what's going, been going on. <coughs> Excuse me. In the process of doing this, I approached this project much like I would approach any other project that I worked on. And that was with a deep sympathy for the people that I was talking to. And, and by that, I mean the, the troops, the men and women, um, the US soldiers, and trying to understand their perspectives and what was it that they were facing and, and how were they trying to understand the hierarchies in which they had to 
exist and, and what the experiences were for them. And I must say, I gained a lot and it really changed me as a person to really try and understand how um, men and women who's, who were fighting in the, in the wars um, were sort of incorporated into this giant war machine and, and sort of has what, ha what happened to them. And so my talk will be hard to pin down in terms of sort of where my position is, but um, I, I have, I have, you know, I, I have a, I'm trying to kind of be clear about where I stand on this in some, in some ways. Um, I began in 2006, 2007 collecting cultural training material, um, sort of strategy documents and all sorts of other analytical material um, tied to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And in 2007, did interviews with US troops who had served in both places, long, sort of anywhere between an hour and three hours. Um, and then in 2008 and 2009, did interviews with Iraqis who had had contact with US servicemen and women. Um, and my, my goal in this was to understand the role that culture had played in these, in these wars. And I'm intentionally not defining culture because I'm trying to understand what, what people meant by culture when they were talking about culture, not sort of imposing my own sort of definition of it on them. I did another, I had someone interview more Iraqis in 2011, and then in 2011 and 2012, I also interviewed more um, troops, another sort of 35, I think. So I have sort of two large data sets of, of qualitative, in-depth, open-ended interviews with um, US troops and with Iraqis. I have never interviewed Afghans, because I have never been to Afghanistan um, or to Pakistan to interview them, but um, I, I tried to sort of incorporate what they're what they're doing. So my research focuses on how strategies about fighting the wars includes ideas about culture and how training incorporates these ideas and transfers them down the chain to the troops on the ground and how the troops think about and act in relation to Iraqis and Afghans. I also bring to these perspectives my knowledge of the experiences of Iraqis and Afghans to inform these discussions. It was, after all, their countries that were invaded and occupied, and they rightfully should voice and evaluate the failures and successes of these 21st century wars. I'm going to give you a tiny bit of historical background that I have chosen as relevant to my talk, um, because I think like half the people in this room probably don't even remember when the US um, invaded Afghanistan in October of 2011, um, following the September 11th attacks by Al Qaeda on, on the United States. In December, um, Afghan groups agreed on an interim government, and Karzai was sworn in as head of the interim power-sharing government. And the shift from that kind of bombing war to what was what one might call a build, a build sort of um, way of thinking. In April of 2002, President Bush called for the U.S. and international community to finance the reconstruction of the country. And I wanted to show sort of this slide. I don't know if you can see at the top is U.S. casualties number of US military deaths in Afghanistan by month, October 2001 to the present. And the bottom picture is of uh, US troop levels, the number of US military deployed in the war in Afghanistan at the year's end between 2001 and 2010. So it doesn't take a genius to see that the, they have, they are, <laughs> there's a correlation there between sort of troop levels and also um, numbers of injured and killed. Um, Afghanistan kind of is put on the back burner well um, the US uh, administration decides to invade Iraq in March of 2003 and then very shortly on May 1st of 2003 President Bush lands on an aircraft carrier 30 miles from the Southern California coast under a banner saying mission accomplished and this marks what the administration declared was the end of major combat operations in Iraq. Um, with the end of this phase, the war in Iraq shifted from the initial invasion phase to a period of rebuilding. However, the Department of Defense, under the leadership of Donald Rumsfeld, <laughs> maintained control in Iraq, disbanded the ORHA, the Operation of uh, Reconstruction um, and Humanitarian Assistance, and then sidelined the civilian components of government most prominently the State Department and USAID, 
who had experience in, in such matters from other places. And instead, the Department of Defense established the Coalition Provisional Authority, the CPA, under the direct command of the DOD and headed by Paul Bremer. Bremer then disbanded the Iraqi army in May of 2003. Um, and as a result, the once ubiquitous, ubiquitous Iraqi security apparatus disappeared and the US military handed the job of security with little knowledge of the country, limited boots on the ground, and positions on bases well removed from the population. Um, that's, that's where they were. And then Bremer ordered the debathification of the civil service of estimated tens of thousands of Ba'ath Party members and all mid and high level government employees who had stayed in Iraq and were willing to work were then dismissed from their jobs. As a result, within a few months, the US government, uh, within the few months of the US government declaring mission accomplished, there was no longer a functioning state or security apparatus in the country. Jumping back to Afghanistan in 2005 um, and six, there are several, there are elections for president and parliament. And in 2006, NATO assumes responsibility for security across the whole of Afghanistan. The idea then, as it was in Iraq, was to train the Afghan police and army to take <coughs> over the institutions of the police and army. Um, and as you know, in Afghanistan, the road has been a, a very um, bumpy one. As you can see, by 2005 and 2006, the attacks on US troops are on the rise. And um, again, also among Afghans, estimates are that in the first couple of years, which I don't have up on this graph, um, in 2001, 2002, 1,300 Afghan civilians were killed in the bombing. Um, and of course, a few thousand others probably died because of injuries and starvation. But by 2005, 6, 7, as you can see, these numbers are jumping. Um, these are just civilian deaths. Add to them in uh, 2007, um, there are a total of something like 7,700 people killed. So an, um, another five. 5,500 on top of that. In 2008, there's another 5,000 militants estimated killed, um, and it keeps going up. Now, the rising death tolls as this conflict shifts are, in the early stages of the war, were, all, were inflicted by the bombing campaigns um, of, of the US and, and among other things. But as the, as the war in Afghanistan shifts, it becomes um, what, what I think they are calling um, anti-government forces killing the majority of Afghan civilians. So those would be Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and other anti-government forces. By 2009 and 10, these, are, these deaths account for 80% of the civilian deaths in Afghanistan. My point in bringing this up, and, and I'll, I'll make it clear also the same thing that is happening in Iraq, um, is that the US is failing to protect the civilians both in Iraq and Af Afghanistan. And that is one of the things that I would posit is one of the sort of the biggest problems in the war and one of the biggest reasons why the US has not been able to sort of um, hold on to um, the good sentiment of the people um, if there was, or you know, to sort of even win hearts and minds. I'll talk about that more in a little, in a little bit. So why the turn to culture? <laughs> I'm going to posit here that I think that the, the turn to culture um, in this period emerges in large part because of the US military's recogni recognition of its inability to achieve the stated military objectives in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan with conventional military force. There are some parallels between the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, but most of them are in terms of how the US government and military chose to fight those wars rather than the nature of the regimes or the people against whom they were fighting. And I think when you go back and look at these two wars, you see in both places the initial goal of the US government under the Bush administration um, and, and then the goal that they gave the military was to remove from power and to eliminate the Taliban in Afghanistan and its Al-Qaeda supporters and Saddam Hussein's regime in Iraq. <coughs> Sorry. In other words, the wars were envisioned and the military was tasked with the idea that this was a limited duration and strategic strike, strike with the intent of regime change. And I think this explains to a certain extent the sort of shock and awe bombing campaigns, the lack of a sufficient invasion force on the ground, 
And in the case of Iraq in particular, the massive amount of destruction wrought upon the Iraqi infrastructure in 2003. The short-term goal was victory over the regime without looking beyond that. That was what the military was tasked to do, and that was what the military did. Numerous commentators, and many of the participants themselves, have noted the, have noted the absence of, part, of preparations by the US government for what came after the invasions, the what next question, or for the task of occupation or nation building in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I take offense with the idea, of, with, particularly in Iraq, with the term of nation building, because it suggests that there was no nation there. Um, call it state building, call it nation rebuilding, but nation building suggests that it's an empty slate that we can come in and, and, and build. So the above mentioned policies, the invasion of Iraq and then the disbanding of the Iraqi military, the debathification of the civil service and the limited number of troops on the ground, as well as Saddam Hussein's release of criminals from prison, among other factors, resulted in a, in a descent into chaos mixed with a growing resentment of the US occupation. The military then tried to control the chaos in the vacuum that it had created by doing what it was trained to do using overwhelming force to achieve military control. This ultimately failed both as a strategy and a tactic, and as the, U as the US military ne never gained control of the country until many years later. But instead, it alienated huge, huge swaths of the population with its heavy-handed tactics with civilians and its inabilities to make the country functional again. In Afghanistan, there was a slightly different situation, but I'm not going to go into the details of that. Um, here. The failures in Iraq in particular, but also in Afghanistan, are the result of the lack of vision and leadership of the Bush administration. Um, and, I, and I try to be really specific in my work in talking about the military, because the military is tasked with doing what the government tells it to do. The military does not really have much choice in this matter. Um, and so I've, I'm trying to be very specific about who sort of does what and how. And so the military has to go invade the countries because it's been told to by the government, in other words. I learned this very clearly when I was talking to people, um, particularly senior officers in the military, and recognizing that they did not have the choice to say no. I mean, they of course could say no, but then they would you know, be fired from their jobs or have to leave them. Um, and, and that's part of our, um, our separation of powers in the United States in that the military is commanded by a civilian um, leader who is the president. All of this said, my analysis that this is the failure um, of vision and leadership of the Bush administration should not be understood to suggest in any way that military invasions done properly and well planned would not also result in such problems. So I'm not suggesting that if we only did it better, then it would be okay. I'm actually suggesting that we shouldn't do it at all, but that may be another that may be another talk. Um, so it's in this environment in 2005, 2006, in both Afghanistan and Iraq, as, as Iraq is descending into chaos and there's wide level sectarian violence as, uh, as they struggle, as they, as they fight for power within Iraq, and as Afghanistan, as, um, as there's increasing attacks on coalition um, troops and NATO troops, and as there's increasing attacks on Afghan civilians, that the um, military comes out with um, FM field manual, FM3-24, which is called the counterinsurgency manual. And it was born under the leadership of General Petraeus, who we all know, who spearheaded um, what had been his strategy in northern Iraq into a new global approach in this coin. Using the field manual and other military, in the, in the coming years, the, in the years following 2006, the military slowly created a new way of dealing with populations that de-emphasized military firepower in favor of, counter, of a counterinsurgency strategy that emphasized human interaction and engaging with hearts and minds. The COIN doctrine was taken up by a military that was struggling to ensure its own superiority over an ever-changing resistance to its presence. Maintaining control was complicated by the fact that the US military was trying to train the Iraqi and Afghan military and police to do some of the work that the US military was doing and to approach their job with the same sense of patriotism, security, and vigilance as that held by the US military. Culture became a conduit to better engage 
with what are called the good guys, as well as a way to fight what they called the bad guys. And I'm going to talk about that in a, in a minute. General Petraeus' critique of U.S. strategy during the first, census, first years of these wars, and one with, that my own research with Iraqis affirms, is that from the outset, the U.S. military prior to prioritized its own security far above the security and well-being of Iraqi and Afghan civilians. Um, while many Iraqis accepted and celebrated that the U.S. had liberated Iraqis from the despotic rule of, uh, of Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath Party regime, they also found that the condition of their lives following the 2003 invasion contradicted the liberationist rhetoric of the U.S. government. They found it increasingly difficult to reconcile between feeling free of despotic rule and the ongoing destruction to the infrastructure of Iraq, the unexpected threats to their personal safety by U.S. troops during house searches or while they were driving down the street or when they were just standing on the roofs of their houses, and the overwhelming violence, corruption, and lawlessness that they lived on a daily basis. The Iraqis questioned why the most powerful military in the world that was occupying and running their country could also not keep their neighborhoods and children safe, ensure regular, uh, regular electricity and water supply, and figure out how to get someone to pick up the garbage at the very least. They saw US troops living in well-protected bases and patrolling the streets heavily armed, armored, and geared up, helmets and gloves and sunglasses and guns drawn sunglasses on and guns drawn, and Iraqis experienced being yelled at, fired upon, and interrogated by masked, in masked interpreters after being thrown on the ground. In this general atmosphere that went on for years, Iraqis did not feel liberated. They felt occupied. For the US troops, from their perspectives, all of these precautions were, of course, understandable, particularly from the perspective of force protection. The U.S. troops didn't want to lose service members to gunfire, snipers, car bombs, or suicide bombings. But it failed to protect the Iraqis from those things. And in doing so, it lost the goodwill that the overthrow of Saddam Hussein had generated among many Iraqis. It also meant the troops paid a cost, sort of that, that Coyne tries to kind of go back and, and sort of and, and recapture, for not interacting with the population, for not building relationships with people in the areas, for not being smarter about gathering intelligence, and for not having more foresight about the consequences of their actions. And I'm going to tell you uh, um, the following story, which was told to me by an Air Force sergeant about his experiences in Iraq in 2007, which suggests how the prioritization, prioritization of both the specific mission and the overall goal of getting <laughs> the bad guys endangered Iraqis who were not the target made them vulnerable and alienated, alienated them without tangible results for the mission. And this is a picture from Flickr um, by this particular user, um, and those are all his words. Um, but I'm going to read a story that kind of relates to this picture. So this Air Force sergeant says, quote, we did a raid one night in Iraq off the Tigris River with some rangers conducting area-wide clearances of homes. The first house we raided, there were no men in the home, just a half a dozen women with children and one older gentleman in there. It was a huge fiasco on this one. No one was useful there, so why were we there? We needed info. So, sorry, I he, step away from him. He uses uh, inappropriate language, and I'm just gonna read it, so just sorry about that. So he says, we needed info. So instead of being a dick about it, we could have brought them in and said, sorry, we have to do this raid, we're looking for these people, and if we're smart, we'd bring a woman with them, let the wife get dressed, calm them down, and talk to them. When they're getting shot at, bombs are going off, people go into flight or flight. But of course, we don't do that. Instead, the interpreter beat the old guy to get information and got nothing. Another problem. The respect for the older guy is gone. So here is the interpreter, who doesn't have to abide by the law of armed conflict, and is a third country nat national representing the US, and he's doing the dirty work. So we go into another house. Here I watched a family get completely mortified. We woke up the family, husband, son, and wife. The husband is educated, but we didn't find this out till later. We we're throwing at people around, yelling at them. We didn't have any intel, which is intelligence information, on this particular house, just that we were doing an area-wide clearance of homes. The father and son spoke English, therefore they were rolled up and taken to base for interrogation. And then we left a single female alone in a house with a broken door in the middle of the night after a raid. That's the end of his quote. So this sergeant was highly critical of the way that this raid happened but he framed it within the area-wide sweep of homes, and thus it was how things were done. He did suggest that the process could be left re less rough and that letting people get dressed and cover themselves and talking to them in normal tones of voice was a better way to proceed. 
In most of the interviews that I conducted, these stories came out in response to my questions about how they took culture into consideration in their work. And the responses often suggested a few things, such as letting women cover themselves, or to gather them with the other women, or to not be disrespectful of the elders in the house, and that the, the army troops, or I'm sorry, the military troops thought that these were cu cultural considerations. And while it is likely true that these are important <coughs> things in Iraqi and Afghan culture, but the experience from the point of view as Iraqis is that, that these things are not about culture. For Iraqis, they saw this much more as a universal human experience, that having your house barged into in the middle of the night by armed men yelling at you in a language that you don't understand, seeing yourself or your wife or your mother or your sister in her nightgown being patted down by, a strange, by strange men, and having your family members cuffed and hooded and beacon being taken away for no re reason, they saw this as not at all unique to their culture, or that addressing these issues were not about cultural issues. As the sergeant himself says, these things could be done differently in ways that preserve the mission effectiveness, but don't humiliate, disrespect, and overpower the people that they want to be on their side. In thinking about this, this kind of acquiescence of US troops to conducting raids and kill or capture actions in these ways becomes clearer when knowing that the troops on the ground were struggling with what they thought of as the enemy and how the enemy was constantly shifting. The war began in Iraq in 2003 with a fight against the Iraqi army of Saddam Hussein. After the war was declared over, they were told that the enemy was no longer the Iraqi army, but now the Ba'athist resistance, or Iraqi nationalists. And then it shifted to Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and at some point in there the Mahdi army was the bad guys, and then shifted out of that and became the good guys again at some point. And then there were Iranian and Arab sympathizers that they had to be on the lookout for as well. My point in listing all of this is that in the mind's eye of the US troops, it made every Iraqi suspect because the enemy shifted so regularly among these groups. In my interviews with US service members, they referred to the people they were fighting at any given time as the bad guys, which was the seemingly generic label about sentiment or quality or the side they were on. Um, rather than who that enemy actually was. The US troops then went from liberating the country and think of, thinking of themselves as liberating the poor, oppressed Iraqis to scrutinizing and suspecting every one of them as a potential bad guy. And I'll, I'll give you another story here from a Marine colonel who we interviewed. And he told the following story that occurred during his deployment in 2006 in Iraq. And it illustrates some of the issues about the lack of trust of Iraqis, and his story kind of provides a very potent Iraqi response. <clears throat> he says, we went to Camp Fallujah, and General Dia, an Iraqi general, briefed the US general in charge of battle space. He said, I want to take battle space. I want to take responsibility for this area over here. <clears throat> He gave a real good brief, especially for an Iraqi, and the US general approved. He got the battle space, and the Marine unit that was there was going to leave, and the Iraqis were going to control their own battle space. We walk out of Camp Fallujah, the briefing area, and Leo is, is, is ecstatic. He's got his own battle space. He's making progress. We are slowly turning over. Well, we go to the PX, which is the store on the base, and Leo says, I'm going to buy you something, a Coke or something. So we go there, and the guards are from Uganda contracted guards, and they don't let the awe into the PX. So an Iraqi general, and he can't go into the PX. The awe is livid, and what do I say? He is a general officer, he is an ally. If he were a Brit or anything else, they would have let him in. But an Iraqi, there isn't that trust. And then he says, well, there are allies. They wouldn't let him in, and he is in front of his officers, and so Dia does, and I took it, man. He says, I took it like a man. He screamed and yelled at me, this is my country, this is Iraq, and, and on and on, and rightfully so. And I was going to then take him to Chow, to the dining facility, but he wouldn't go. He pulled me aside, and you know how they hold your hand. He grabs my hand, and he pulls me aside, and he looks at me, and he has watery eyes, and he says, you know what the real thing is here? I'm, I'm hurt. And the Marine Colonel says, I understood that. Hell, I was hurt too. And that's the end of my story. 
So I think his story shows how the U.S. government and military wanted to be seen as helping Iraqis build their country, um, to be treated with respect for their efforts, certainly, and for you know, so the, the U.S. Um, lives lost, and to be judged by what they do. And in this case, the Iraqi general does right does the right military thing in both his brief to the U.S. command and in wanting to take responsibility for an area, and yet he cannot be he is not allowed into the store on the base because he is an Iraqi. He is in this sense not ju he is judged not by his actions but by his nationality, and the suspicions automatically engendered because of that identity. The situation and the complicated relationship between American forces and Iraqis and, and Afghans as well, both civilian and military, is complicated because of the U.S. governmental policies about rebuilding both countries. In the post-invasion periods, the expected role of the U.S. military personnel on the ground was never made clear or defined. And another example from Iraq, one army captain explains, he says, quote, I think uh, that after the initial invasion, where over the the first maybe month or two, the American army, army institutionally said, let's fix every problem. Then they went to a point where they said, no, this is an Iraqi problem. This is your problem. I'm the American army. I came here to get rid of Saddam Hussein, and I came to provide some basic global security, but not that garbage. That stuff, that's an Iraqi problem. And I think the Iraqis, they were like, what do you mean? You're the biggest power. You're in control of the country. You should be solving these problems. And I think this, this quote, which I heard in for various incarnations in a couple different from a couple different people, was that there was this just real disconnect between sort of what people thought different groups were supposed to do, and I think also there was a real sort of not understanding of of sort of power and what that sort of meant. Um, I would suggest that power is as in in these all these different analyses is as least is as important. Let me restate that. Power is as important as culture in these wars. Um, but there seemed little effort to integrate um, sort of the ideas of power and culture into developing understandings of the roles both power and culture played by military strategists. So what I'm going to shift to now is my question number two, I think, is what did the military train its troops in in this terms of what, how did it and how did it define culture? In the context of creating a new strategy to better fight and win the wars, um, culture was directly introduced into the 30 plus page chapter on intelligence and counterinsurgency that was in the COIN manual that I had up. This one. The inclusion of culture opened the door for culture and cultural knowledge to take a, a new role in the US military strategy and tactics, including increased funding um, and integration of the one of the work done by US military cultural centers for training intelligence and combat units. As the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan became increasingly violent and out of control, the military developed a myriad of new programs designed to address issues of culture. Building on the prominence and vision of the well-respected uh, Defense Language Institute, each branch of the US military either established new bodies or enhanced the capacity of existing ones um, to produce cultural training materials and to provide cultural training and these things occurred between 2005 and 2007. In addition, um, the military sponsored the, the, the startup of the human terrain system, um, which would send um, human terrain teams out, um, of the, who were civilian social scientists, to embed with military units. And I'll show you um, what they were doing. Yeah. Um, and they, they started this program in 2006. It, for the last couple of years, it's been um, continued to be funded at a, at around somewhere in the ballpark figure of $150 million a year annually. Um, <clears throat> the emphasis on culture from the COIN manual and the implementation of the ideas contained within it um, sort of trickled down to the level of troop training, um, and it necessitated anthropologists and others working in the military um, on to figure out what it meant by culture. The United States Air Force, um, sorry, this is the, this is the Army, um, Culture and Language Center developed, the, um, developed programs for enlisted airmen to take, including an introduction to culture and an introduction to cross-cultural communication. This is the Army TCC uh, courseware, which you can see has advanced leaders course, initial military training, 
captain's career course and basic leaders course. And they say things like, what is culture? Who am I? Influences on culture, cross-cultural communication, etc. The The data that I've collected on this from this research pro project reveals the changing experiences with um, the troops' responses to the cultural training programs. And almost everyone that I interviewed pre-2006 thought that the cultural training that they had received was not at all useful or relevant um, to what they were doing um, in Iraq and, and Afghanistan, nor was it what they needed. And these were some of the first things that were handed out. Um, you can see the Army version, which is, sorry, the Marine Corps version, which is the green version of the Iraq Culture Smart Card. Um, this was issued in 2004. Um, the Iraq Culture Smart Card, um, this is the Army version. Um, continued to be issued up through 2009, and they've developed other ones of these. They had things like religion, which is a, um, over there, tells you just the sort of basic pillars of Islam, etc., um, and things that were less useful and highly inaccurate to the point of absolute ridiculousness, and I don't know where they got this information, in things like clothing and, clothing and gestures. Um, they also trained people in language, and this is a program done by the Tra Tactical Language and Culture Group, um, and this, this particular version is called Tactical Iraqi, and they were using CGI material, and then that little, this person here would talk to that person and you would see it and stuff. So this was called Tactical Iraqi. But the people that I interviewed post-2007 um, were much more interested in having more cultural training and they commented on the quality of the training that, that, that had been developed. Um, they found that the cultural training was relevant to what they were being asked to do and there was a sort of a better alliance between mission and training for the mission. In addition, the troops that I interviewed post-2007 repeated that they were constantly being told that culture was important. And this was probably one of the trickle-downs from the implementation of the COIN doctrine. And thus, while they may or may not have thought um, that culture was the right way to approach the issue, or even the most effective way, they learned the framework of it and that it was the way to think. I think the more um, positive response to the cultural training was due both to the fact that it was better, I mean, it just was better material, um, and that it was sort of being promoted as more important. And more and more of the training is computer-based or real-life simu simulations targeting kinetic, visual, kinetic and visual learning skills rather than these kind of cards or somebody standing up there and telling you what to do and what not to do. Um, so the, the CBTs, the computer-based trainings, are units the troops watch and then they click through them on their own, transferring information was also sometimes given through lectures, and other times they had sort of pretend you're a, a whatever, um, in whatever scenario, interactive scenes. There were two or three or more camps developed where they were mock Afghan villages or mock Iraqi villages, and where people would go and do um, interactive work with mock Afghans and mock Iraqis who were, um, sorry, I'm gonna show you a video now. This is from the Air Force um, Culture and Language Center, and this is their program called VEST, and it's a, just a sort of short three minutes, you'll see. Oh, the sound's not going. It was on when we, when we tried it. Hmm. It worked before. Anyway, you can watch it. It's just about us. Yeah. There we go. Good music. There's no full screen option? No. Thank you. 
but I'm sure we can work things out. Yes, you are you. Will you talk to her, please? In America, you must learn at all costs. Playing a game, playing an argument. One winner, you have one loser. That's so much in the fence. Please accept this scimitar as my gift. Um, Orientalist tropes um, and music and things aside, I can, uh, just from having looked at all of this material, I can see how much more engaging this would be and how you could actually learn something and, and how the content of what is there is actually really useful. Um, there are other things that make my head spin around in it, but yeah. Um, so the coin strategies that were being implemented were, re were requiring troops to know much more about culture, language, um, and basic religious beliefs, and as well as sort of for them to kind of understand with the passage of time what it meant for them to be there. And this was best illustrated, I think, in a comment made by one explosive ordnance disposal technician who said in the interview with me, he said that they were finally realizing that they have to go back to places where they've been before that they can't just blow through some place and get the job done. He says, quote, when we know there's an IED somewhere, we go to whoever's land it's on, and we sit down, and we talk to them, and they tell, we tell them what we're going to do, and tell them we're going to try and protect their property, and we thank them, because we know we're going to have to go back. And he contrasted this with when he had been in Afghanistan earlier. I'm sorry, when he'd been posted in it. This was in, when he was talking about being in Afghanistan in 2009, and when he'd been in Iraq earlier, he had said um, he had said that they had just they would just go somewhere and kick everybody out of the way and blow stuff up and not worry about what had actually happened. And as troops were being, I mean, the people that I interviewed in 2007, I think only two had been deployed to more than one location. The people that I interviewed in 2011, I think every single one of like, so I interviewed about 35 people. Every single one of them but two had been deployed multiple times, some of them up to five times. And so they were also experiencing that this wasn't going to be a first time thing and that they were building on what their predecessors, who may have been themselves, um, were doing. Um, I realize I have a limited time here, so let me go through just a few more things. Those trained in the pre-deployment cultural training programs have tended to be targeted groups of officers and others based on their military occupation specialty. The theory has been that if the officers have such training, they will emphasize its importance to their team members and pass that along. However, in day-to-day -day affairs, the officers are also the ones who tend to have interpreters with them, who not only translate, but also help out with cultural issues. In my research, most people recalled that at some point that the, the most they had learned about culture was from the conversations that they had with their translators. However, the people who are on the ground interacting with Iraqis and Afghans on the sort of on the most basic level and not with the kind of elite of both of those societies were actually the lower level um, um, troops who didn't necessarily have a translator with them. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting idea to train the leadership, sort of the, and yet to send the people who don't have the specialized training to go out and actually interact with the population. I wasn't quite, wasn't quite. I was, I was seeing some real sort of serious issues there that they were expressing. In the last three years, since about 2010, the Army and Marines have implemented <coughs> implemented new re requirements for the training of troops, and so this is all about Afghanistan now. Um, there's a new emphasis on specializing in a region or a language that can be part of a career trajectory. And this requirement is manifesting, manifesting itself in different ways. 
Since July 2010 in the Army, it has required a four to six hour online training program in basic language and culture to all soldiers deploying to Afghanistan. And since February 2010, the Marine Corps has required that all Marines complete cultural training, which for those going to Afghanistan consists of one day of training and selected others are to receive language training. There are many, many more examples of this, which I will um, skip in the interest of time. Um, but there seems to be a real emphasis on this, this kind of thing. The, the, these new types of programs build on the work of those um, supporters of cultural awareness and training, and most would think that this money and resources are well spent. And there is no doubt that the training itself is useful, necessary, and a good investment. But what also seems to have taken place, however, is that the skills the troop develop in their pre-deployment training, which is now required of them in both the culture and language fields, are then not being taken into consideration in terms of their deployment. One Afghan, um, sorry, one Air Force staff sergeant that I interviewed had completed a Dari language training class and was then sent to a province in Afghanistan that is entirely Pashto speaking. So his skills were totally worthless. Um, the Departments of Defense and Service Guidance require the military to document language and cultural training completion. But a Government Accountability Office review of the programs in 2011 concluded that there is not one unified system to do so. Some units recorded on paper, other re others record the information in the personnel system, and the Army does not have data fields for all mandatory language and culture tasks in their primary training system. And thus, quote, units were unable to document the completion of the training. Likewise, the Marine Corps encourages people to complete language training, but it then does not require those who completed the training to take formal proficiency tests, and thus did not have information on their proficiency in the language. The GAO report concluded in 2011 that, quote, by not capturing information within service level training and personnel systems on the training that general purpose forces have completed, um, and the language proficiency gained from training, the Army and the Marine Corps do not have the information they need to effectively leverage the language and cultural knowledge and skills of these forces when making individual assignments and assessing future operational needs. Simply stated, there's no follow through assessment or evaluation on the broader scale of the programs and training. And whether or not they're effective or utilized effectively is a matter of a service member's job, character, and luck, I will say. Okay, I'm gonna conclude now. <clears throat> While the cultural and linguistic knowledge of troops has markedly improved over the years, the military apparatus and personnel structures have not capitalized on that knowledge systematically in terms of recording cultural and linguistic achievements of troops or making deployments based on training. Most military would suggest that this is a bureaucratic snafu. However, given the types of training and the skills that the troops who were interviewed recall as important, the more effective and skill successful skills that they have acquired for dealing with the populations are less related to culture and more about skills like patience, perspective, communication, and respect. The question remains as to whether an occupying military force can figure out how to train soldiers to be culturally sensitive or patient or respectful of others when that force is tasked with missions that involve violence and are done within the framework of a military occupation of another country. The cultural turn in the military has never been one that was wholeheartedly adopted either by the leadership or by the troops, and many of them are very dismissive of it. Complaints about it suggested that it was an ineffective, that it was a touchy-feely fix, and not something they joined the military to learn, or that more force was needed to show these people what could happen to them if they didn't do what the US wanted them to do. These responses point to the fundamental contradictions of the shift to culture in war. Can a country bomb and build simultaneously? Is cultural training and civilian engagement a salve for the wounds of war? Does creating troops that know culture and can win hearts and minds create a gentler face of a violent imperial policies that envision invasions and occupations as justified, sustainable, and ethical? And these are some of the larger, heady questions that I would like to have answers to, but I don't necessarily. Um, but I will suggest that the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Iraq in 2010 and the planned withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan in 2014 and the shift to drone warfare, including in areas where we are not officially at war, in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia, among others, suggests that the cultural knowledge phase 
of counterinsurgency and warfare is no longer of great concern to the military, either in preparation or in practice. It seems more likely, particularly in the post-Bush era, that the US wants to separate the bomb portion from the build portion of policies, returning each to its own domain. USAID and the State Department are front and center again in building, while both the CIA and the US military each have an arsenal of drones, <coughs> along with other weapons, to deal with military threats. It will be interesting to see in the coming years if the new technologies and the shifts to targeted, uh, targeted assassinations have made it unnecessary for the US military in times of war or other times to interact with people and win the hearts and minds of those who are now their military targets. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, excuse me. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. Let me uh, begin by asking you uh, I think it's safe to say that you are not an uh, enthusiast of the uh, U.S. project uh, yeah. in these countries. Uh, but you yourself have a, a fascinating kind of set of knowledge now because you've looked at this from multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, and as an outsider, and as someone who is skeptical mm -hmm. of the purpose, but nevertheless professionally very interested in what's being achieved. Um, can I ask you to put on a different hat, which is a hat of someone who is you know, fully embracing this mission? And mm -hmm. to say, um, are there particular things about a culture that you feel you know well that would actually make for not only a gentler occupation, but one that therefore is more successful? I, I would say, at least from the US officers I talked to on Iraq and the US civilian side, the goal was not to stay in Iraq. You know, They wanted to get out. Their view after a certain point was, how do we get out and leave less of a mess behind? Which, I don't know if that's your view on it, but having gone there and broken it, you know, are there things um, that they should have done culturally, as opposed to just good practices in general? Mm -hmm. Or is culture really kind of marginal? A lot of your talk to me seem to say, this isn't about culture. About power, it's about basic respect for human beings, regardless of where they live and, and so on. Uh, but are there specific cultural things you recommend? No. I mean, I think, I think, so I think the the, the problem in the in Iraq, we've broken it, and now you know the pottery barn rule that Colin Powell is so famous for being sort of trotted out. Um, I was against the war, I mean the invasion, but I saw that it could have, you know, that, that it was possible, wearing my whatever other hat I'm going to put on at the moment. But I, in, in, in following what the Iraqis were actually saying, I think the problem was um, the CPA and Bremer and Rumsfeld's hold on the DOD on control of all of that. I mean, not only did Rums, not only did Bremer get rid of the military and the debathification, which completely sidelined any Iraqi voice in the military or in their actual sort of building of their state, he then canceled elections. And so if, I mean, and, and so Iraqis are sitting there going, hang on a second now. I mean, all Iraqis were just going like, wait, you've invaded our country to liberate us, which is great, we didn't like Saddam Hussein, but now, you, our military, we can't work in the military. I mean, there were demonstrations by Iraqi military saying, please let us go back to work. And it's not, I mean, it doesn't, you know, it's not rocket science to figure out that if you disband the military, those are the guys with all the keys to all the storehouses who know where everything is. So they now have no, no jobs. I mean, you know, that they're gonna sell the weapons on the open market should not, you know, you don't need, <laughs> you don't, I mean, I could have told them that and I don't know anything about these subjects. So the, it was those acts, I think, that really set the entire Iraqi populace, 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 for the most part, against them. So it was sort of really crucial mistakes, rather than kind of cultural things. And I think, I mean, in, I, I talked to people who served, to, I talked to US troops who served early in 2003, 2004, and they describe it as the Wild West. I mean, they could do whatever they wanted, and they did. And I mean, and some of the snipers that I interviewed, I mean, I feel, I mean, I feel sort of the deep injustice that we have done to, to these people because they're basically untrainable afterwards. I mean, you know, what work, you learn to be a sniper in the military, where are you gonna go after that? I mean, and they, they, you know, one guy said to me, you know, I was acting as God. It was my decision if that guy lives or dies and I could do whatever I wanted to on whatever day. And they could, 
I mean, and they could make those kinds of decisions. And then you take that person and you say, okay, go be a security guard at Safeway because that's, you know, you have security skills now and you can do that. We have kind of done something to our own population, not just the occupation, but to our own population that has a lasting impact that we're not really kind of dealing with. So you, you asked me the question about, you know, can we do the occupation right, that it's, that it's you know, respectful or gentler or whatever. And I, I don't think we can. I mean, I think a military occupation is a military occupation, and it's going to mess people up on both sides of it. It's going to mess people up on the American side of it, and it's going to mess people up on the other side of it. Is it worth it? That's, I mean, I would say no, but that's a different, that's a different, you know, kind of question. To if you were a political scientist rather than an anthropologist, I would tell you to title your work The Culture Myth, <laughs> because you're, you're very critical of it, and I know that's not the direction you but I'm actually not critical of it because I actually think these are skills that if we were to teach these to the US troops, how to be, you know, how to engage with populations, how to talk to them, how to think of people as, you know, as other human beings, those are skills that they can take when they're done with their service and they're no longer a sniper and they can actually take that and get a job with that. But that's a, that's a capital, I mean, that's a, a social a skill that they will have. And that, that, that our military, for better or for worse, is, is about guns. I mean, it's about firepower. And is that the kind of military that we want to have? That's not the kind of military that I, as an American, want to have, although I understand that. So I'm not anti-culture, because I actually think those are really useful skills in terms of talking to people and in terms of how you interact with, I mean, in the military even. They know how to be respectful to other, you know, to their Italian counterparts, to their, you know, to their Argentinian counterparts, whatever. But suddenly, occupation makes them lose that. And if we kind of, I've I've been looking at the culture cards for um, Italy, and I've been looking at the the, the cultural training for the Dutch um, via a, a master's or a PhD thesis someone wrote, and they're totally different. They're about, you know, they tell the Italians to take their sunglasses off, which I think is just really funny. Like when you go to meet an, meet an Iraqi or an Afghan, take your sunglasses off. Because it's about eye contact, it's about being human, it's about, I mean, they're, they're, I mean, otherwise they're kind of similar, but it's these, these little things that are like, sorry. So culture is important, but I don't think it's, yeah, sorry. So this will date me a little bit, but I can remember uh, as an undergraduate sitting in Henry Kissinger's class <laughs> and, hearing him, and hearing him talk about the, um, the importance of culture vis-a-vis -vis feelings in Vietnam mm -hmm. and hearts and minds, which of course I think is where that phrase got coined. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in this, I, I was wondering if in the course of doing this work, you came across any resonance? I mean, my, my sense is that it was it was a big issue in Vietnam days, and then of course it receded in the background because the United States then began to you know have it had a different pattern to its imperial policies, and mm -hmm. and, the, and then as it has and then it resurfaced perhaps when the mm -hmm. context was reproduced in certain ways. But as you talk to people, as you did this research, any resonance with Vietnam in terms of cultural education? Lots, because I think primarily, um, I don't know what they call them, the military, the military officers who have PhDs who have studied these things go back and look at these things. I mean, John Nagel is the, the kind of bigger, biggest, biggest example because he did his how to eat soup with a knife. Is that the, the whole thing about looking at all of the counterinsurgencies in history and how to do that? So yeah, I mean, there's a lot at the, at the brainy level of going back and looking at all of these kinds of things in Afghanistan, I'm sorry, in Vietnam and all of the, and pulling that, that sort of history and knowledge in to the development of policy and strategy mm -hmm. at, that, at that high level. At the level of troops on the ground, no, because they aren't, they're, they're different. They're different populations. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not the same people mm -hmm. at all. So no, they don't, they, they don't carry that with them. But they may go back and read those things. There are re suggested reading lists for people deploying to Iraq and Afghanistan, and some of these things are on them. But, but they don't necessarily pull that material. I have pulled that material, mm -hmm. thank you, Interlibrary Loan. Um, so the Guide to Vietnam and the Guide to the Philippines, they're these little sort of handbooks with these covers, and I'm in the process of trying to read them and understand them and compare them and these kinds of things. 
a lot of this cultural training material, the early stuff, was produced by contractors and not by the military itself. The later stuff that starts coming out after 2006 is produced by, um, is coming out of Fort Huachuca and the Army, this, this group, the Army, um, sorry, now I'm totally blanking on their name, the TRADOC. Um, and they are writing these huge, they actually have culture books, which are quite good. I mean, they're quite informative, particularly for Yemen. Um, it's the one I've read most closely and know something about. And I think they are going back and pulling some of this stuff and looking at it, but in, in similar ways. So I think it's there as a legacy, and I think it's there at the kind of brain, brainy level, but I don't think it's down at the bottom, kind of people on the ground doing stuff level. Uh, well, I know we have a lot of questions now. I'll make sure we can get to some. So I'm going to kind of group them in twos, and uh, hopefully uh, we can get a lot out before we leave. Yeah, I'm Robert Egner. I'm a faculty member of the Security Studies Program. Um, I really like how this story starts out as a study of, of cultural understanding in war, uh, how to improve things, and it ends up as a, as a study of the US military culture in a way. Uh, there's a number of different stories within this book, and I'm just trying to figure out how they're connected. To me, this story about the learning of the importance of culture is so interesting because it, it's you say it, it's useful and it's so much better than in the early days, but at the same time, it completely misses the point. Uh, because the military organization has a particular culture that is adapted for the task of war. Mm -hmm. And it considers itself fighting a war in Afghanistan and Iraq. No one else considers that, of course. And that means the Iraqi family thinks, now, why aren't they respecting the rule of law? Why haven't they talked to my village elder before they come knocking on my door? While the US soldier thinks, I'm fighting a war, I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. But I should probably do it a little better with a little more cultural understanding. So perhaps I should at least let the women dress themselves before I pat them down. Or I should have a woman on my team, or things like that. Which are little tweaks that have nothing to do mm -hmm. with the overall mistake of thinking that this is a war rather than an occupation. We are, we are not uh, an army engaging another <coughs> army. We are the institution of that uh, authority that is supposed to provide for these people rather than mm -hmm. uh, fight them, if you, if you will. So it, it's, it's sort of, uh, again, how do they fit together? Uh, I think this story is sort of a, a, a really highlights the fact that the, the, the military hasn't even begun to understand the problem of, of, of not fighting these things, but conducting these types of activities mm -hmm. in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. okay, one more. Yes, um, the Army seems to have given you significant access. No. Or it did. No. Yeah, was just, that was the premise of my question, <laughs> yeah. but nevertheless. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't ask for it, so yeah, no. Well, I was curious to whether you, there was any way, did you report the military with the results of your study? Were they interested and how did they react to your conclusions or recommendations? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm an anthropologist and I struggle with kind of coming up with conclusions and recommendations because that's not what we do. We're, I'm one of those people that would have us sit around and hold hands and you know kind of talk about it. Um, <laughs> not, not really, but I'm, but, <laughs> um, I have not worked for the military, I will not work for the military, and I will not take money for them. I want to maintain my independence. This study was all funded by Georgetown University, thank you, and by the American Academic Research Institute in Iraq, which is a KORC, a Center for, uh, no, I can't remember what KORC stands for, Centers of American Academic Research Abroad or something of the, that. I didn't want to suggest that, correctly. No, 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 but well, I'm saying this specifically so it's all paid for by you as taxpayers or by you as Georgetown students or those sorts of things. Um, and I've maintained that intentionally because I don't want to get caught up in this sort of stuff and I want to be seen as independent. I will, however, go talk to them whenever they want me to talk to them. So when they invite me to come speak to them, I will come speak to them. Um, and I went and presented my research at TRADOC at the 2010 TRADOC Culture Summit in Fort Huachuca, um, which was an interesting project for me because um, I was talking to all of these culture people 
And I know, just because I was talking to all these culture people, they were all like, uh, yeah, tell us something we don't know. I mean, this was not really the audience that I should have been talking to these sorts of things, because these are the very people that were kind of developing these things, these ideas and these sort of stuff. Um, so they, I, I do go and talk to them, and I, and I will. And I publish my work publicly, and I do all of those sorts of things. I'm also of the um, opinion, and I feel pretty strongly about this, that this is a two-way street that you know every almost every semester but once a year now i teach culture and society of the arab world or anthropology of the arab world or something like that i have never had someone from the military in my class we're at georgetown they can come and they can take pay money and they can take my class if they want to so it's not me that has to go to also talk to them it's that they can also come talk to us um i i publish like i said publicly so they can read it and i knew do know that they do those sorts of things and i have friends among these people who I send my stuff to and who we have conversations, people who are in the military who we have conversations and we have conversations you know, over lunch or things like that. So I'm more than happy to be public, but I want to be public. I don't want to do behind closed doors sorts of stuff because I think that that's um, kind of, that's not who I am as an academic. And I also, you know, I talk to Iraqis and I will at some point, I hope talk to Afghans. And I also want to be honest and upfront with them as well about you know who I'm talking to and what I'm doing. So I, I kind of I think have a sort of a bit of a strange position in this. It certainly doesn't kind of go with the Washington flow, but it's taken a lot of soul searching in me to figure out how to do this because they're more than happy to pay me thousands and thousands of dollars to go talk to them, and I don't want to take that money because I don't want to be part of this imperial what I see as an imperial project of occupation and of destroying other people's countries. So I have tried. This is my own personal opinion on that you're getting into this now but but so I so I maintain I try to maintain my independence as an academic and publish publicly sorry that was a really long and convoluted answer but I also have a million other things to do so I work on this stuff very slowly <laughs> uh, let me grab two more sorry uh, I'm Brian Murphy thank you very much I'm going to date myself I also had Professor Kissinger in Gun 183 um, I had four jobs in Iraq and I recently returned from Afghanistan just a perspective on learning the culture. There were efforts made to introduce us to aspects of the Islamic culture, but because we were in a war zone, it was awfully difficult to get out and actually meet with the people. In both cases, both countries rather, I of course worked alongside Iraqis and Afghans. Last comment, <clears throat> as I said, I had four jobs in Iraq. It was a sea change between the way we were trained about culture started in 2003 and in my last job in 2010, where we had embedded with us very eminent Iraqis, PhDs, and so forth as cultural advisors. I worked for the anti-corruption office of the U.S. Embassy, and we didn't go anywhere without uh, you know, these folks to guide us and tell us what was proper in terms of etiquette and so forth. So it was a real effort, but it's awfully difficult in a war zone mm -hmm. to get out and be with, with and among the people. Mm -hmm. So, I'm thank you. Thank you. Oh, throw one more idea. sure. Just, uh, just sure. Uh, Hi, I'm Megan Cat. I'm a former SS peer, and I now work for the Center for Naval Analyses. Uh, and I have a question regarding if you had looked at all at female engagement teams or cultural mm -hmm. support teams, and what you thought of them. Um, I'm currently working on a project for the Marine Corps. <coughs> excuse me, looking at the future of maintaining some of these skills. And so I'm just wondering if you think they were a useful development, um, and what kind of skills should yeah, um, let me start with that question and then I'll do another addressing. Um, and yes, Megan, thank you for bringing that up because it's really interesting and, I, and prepare yourself. I'm not really going to answer, but I'll say something um, because I don't really know. I mean, I have no way of a, a assessing or, you know, their effectiveness or any of those sorts of things. But I, from, from what I do know is, and I've been watching the videos because lots of them put YouTube is awesome for this kind of thing. There are so many videos up. So they, you know, the military now wears helmet cams, and so some people upload all of these things. So I have a research assistant who's been watching female engagement team videos on YouTube. Um, and they're fascinating because it's one of the, you know, the, the women take off their um, helmets and take off, sometimes even take off their, their um, bulletproof vests and those kinds of things and sit down with women. Presumably they're in corridors, in cordons that are also secure and stuff. 
But I, in, so early on, I always was surprised that because females couldn't be in combat, that they couldn't go on these house raids. And so a lot of the men that I interviewed would say things like, well, we knew we weren't supposed to search the women, but, so we didn't search either, they would say, so we didn't search the women. Um, or we knew we weren't supposed to search the women, but we did anyway. And they cite this as a cultural thing, and I always want to say back, like, when I go through the airport, I don't expect to be searched by a man. It's not really a cultural thing. But that aside, um, it's always really interesting to me that it's our own, that it's the American military's strictures on women's participation that makes this makes these things happen. Not, it's nothing about the Iraqis or the Afghans themselves. So we are actually doing these really weird things that are even to us weird because we don't allow women in combat. I mean, this is up until recently. So they, now that women are in combat, this is kind of a whole nother, whole nother thing that will be interesting to watch how it changes. But one of the things that, and this goes to both um, Robert and Brian's questions, that the military sort of, in the larger sense, never got in terms of making policy, but individuals who worked closely with Afghans or Iraqis did get, was that the Afghans and the Iraqis themselves are changing and adapting to US culture and US military. Um, so in Iraq, you would see young men suddenly are now wearing sunglasses. You would never have seen an Iraqi wearing sunglasses before, but now it's like the cool thing to do because if you're like, you know, Mr. Macho Power, you want to wear sunglasses like the, you know, the American troops. Um, a reporter told me that they now talked, they refer to foreigners in Iraq, this was about five years ago, they refer to foreigners as in Iraq, not as Ajanib or Ajnabi, that they would refer to them as DOD, which is like Department of Defense. I was like, oh my God. Um, and that, this, the, I followed early on in 2003 and others, this really fascinating thing that American troops weren't supposed to do this because that was rude in Iraq. And so I asked Iraqis, well, you know, is it rude to do this? And they were like, well, kind of sort of depends on how you do it. But then if you look at the, uh, if you do a sort of Google image search from 2003, 2004, there are thousands of pictures of Iraqis doing this in back to, to Iraqi troops. This idea that Iraqis and Afghans can learn like culture and what is acceptable and what it means and what isn't and sort of stuff is so crucial to all of this that is, that is was never ever implemented or addressed um, by these kind of cultural training things. And so the female engagement teams, I think, are some of these same sorts of ways. I mean, they're very smart. I mean, by not having a female engagement team and you tell the men not to talk to women, you're losing half the population who knows something that you could really learn, or at least you could sort of, you know, get them on your side. Um, but but we get s the military got stuck in these very static ways of saying Iraqis are this way. And, I mean, this goes back to these 1950s and 1960s anthropological methods that they adopted to teach culture and that they're sort of national character studies. Iraqis are all this way. Well, you know, there's 20 some odd million of them. They're rural, they're urban, they do this, that, you know, I mean, it's like they're not just one static thing. I, I had one guy say to me, yeah, they told us, every single person I interviewed told me, don't show the Iraqis the bottom of your foot, that that's really rude. And one guy was like, yeah, it is really rude until you know them, and then everybody's sitting around with their feet up on their chairs and everybody else's faces, and nobody cares. And I was, and I was like, well, so what does that mean? He's like, well, it's just about etiquette. It's about knowing when not to show people the bottom of your feet and when it's you know it doesn't matter because you're their friend. And I was like, that's something to kind of teach people. So, but they never sort of got that issue of power and that issue of that the U.S. military is the overwhelming power and that the Iraqis are going to adapt to that in various ways culturally as, as well as just trying to understand the Americans who are there. I don't know if you, sorry to jump back in, but I don't know if you're aware, but since last year in Afghanistan, they've actually been trying to teach some Afghans about US yes. culture. Yes, so yeah, which I thought was also yeah. really interesting. Yeah, yeah. 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 Bombard them with television shows. <laughs> Dan, Dan, you also have one back there who I don't think you can see because she's. I can't see, so uh, yeah. he will do it and you'll be our Thank you for your interesting perspective. My name is uh, Colonel Bo Walford. I'm the Air Force fellow here at Georgetown. So the military is engaged in the Georgetown academic community in the body of me at least. No, there's many of you. So uh, I, one thing I, I felt like deserves an overt acknowledgement, and that is that all of this cultural awareness and, 
and cultural action in Iraq and Afghanistan, and obviously in Iraq and, and Afghanistan now not Iraq, occurs in the context of a war zone. That sniper exists because he's providing overwatch for that team that's operating, and so a lot of people are trying to kill that team operating. And I, I, I don't, I don't think that I heard much of acknowledgement of the risk that these troops are facing, uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines alike, as they move around the countryside, not able to distinguish one from another, because they try to blend in and look like one from another inside that society. It's very difficult to do both things, fight a war and engage in culture, yeah. and we're required to do both simultaneously. Right. I completely agree. It's interesting to have these two questions come right one after the other because they are in some ways about the people that are involved in this, both the, the, the troops who are at risk for these sorts of reasons and the, you know, the Afghan or Iraqis or whoever they are, families that are at risk in these operations. I mean, they're fundamentally about people and that's kind of what my work is really trying to say is we're dealing with people who have to do these things and we're not necessarily giving them either the right tools to do this job or we're asking them to do jobs that are putting them at risk that for really unclear reasons or we're trampling over people um, without really kind of other good reasons. I mean, um, Colonel uh, Walter, I'm completely sympathetic to the idea that these people have, are out there having to do this and that I think from my non-scientist armchair that I will sit and say this from, I think that this is one of, the rise, one of the reasons for the rise in PTSD is that people are being asked to do stuff and that they don't think that they should be doing or that they are told that if they do it in a certain way is the right way to do it. And yet 
they're thinking like, you know, okay, these Iraqis want to, you know, take us out or these Afghans want to take us out. And yet this family is sitting here and I've got to go in and do that. You know, and there's a huge confusion there. I mean, at least a lot of the people I talked to were like, I didn't want to be there. I didn't agree with what we were doing, but I just had to do my job. And so it's that job that they're being asked to do where, where I think is a real problem. And that's kind of why I want to talk about this sort of stuff is that, yes, their lives are at risk. And yeah. We, as a country, have sent them there to do this. Well, if I can follow up just briefly. Yep. The military has dealt with that sort of dialectic, that tension, since militaries began operating. Because we kill people, but yet we, we exist to preserve society and order. So there's an inherent tension in what we do. And our culture, our military, our martial culture, is designed to overcome that by telling us that we're doing the right thing. We just follow the, the rules that are laid right. out. So I don't think that that's not applicable here as well. But what I will ask you to, to uh, consider is how do you provide security, which apparently that's the root thing that we're not providing for, for in Iraq, for instance. We didn't provide security. How do you provide security without uh, meeting violence with violence? That's a really big question, and I think it's one that we are struggling with in all, you know, sort of all over the world, and 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 many, you know, sort of much smarter people than I have grappled with this topic. But I'm not willing to kind of sort of give ground to that violence is the only answer. Um, because I think what we did was we prioritized American lives over the lives of the people in the country that we invaded. And that's, if that's the decision that was made, that's fine, but it needs to be acknowledged and recognized as such. So the amount of violence that was wrecked on the lives of, of Iraqis and on the lives of Afghans was incredible. I mean, I was looking at the statistics of Afghans this morning just to, to look at the Afghan civilians who were killed, and I think there were something like 2,000, I mean, one particular year, there were sort of 2,000 or so killed, and there were 3,000 or so injured in a particular thing. And I was like, so everybody, basically everybody who was in whatever happened died. Like, we weren't even able to sort of, whereas when you have troops, we have much higher maim and, and injury rates than we do kill rates because of all of the protections and the fast sort of you know, care that they're given. And, and I know the military is very concerned with taking care of Iraqi and Afghan civilians, and they provide care for them and this sort of things. But the larger umbrella is not. On an individual, personal level, think it may be. But on the larger level, we have created a system by invading these countries that prioritizes our lives over theirs. And yeah, I guess you could say that that's understandable and that's what war is about and everything, which is fine. But we need to be upfront about it and then acknowledge it, that we don't really care about Iraqis and not sort of trot this cultural training out and how to be culturally sensitive and sort of stuff out and say that this. So I mean, what I think has happened is that the, the troops are caught up in this conundrum of we're there to be, you know, we're, we're there to fight, we're there to, you know, fight a war. And yet we're told we have to be nice to them and we have to be respectful and we have to do this. And oh my God, how do I do that? And they don't really know because they're like, I mean, you know, people are pointing guns at them and trying to blow them up. And that making those decisions is really hard. I'm going to pause things, um, even though I think a number of us could go on for really the rest of the afternoon. This is an utterly fascinating discussion. Uh, but uh, this has been a great uh, session. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. But before you leave, please join me. And thank you. Thank you.